Well, let's, let's get the conversation started. As we saw in earlier panels, uh, the format of these uh, panels is conversational, so I'm going to uh, begin our conversation with a series of questions. And I'm going to begin by asking a question of, uh, of Russell Hittinger. Uh, Professor Hissinger, Hittinger, historians generally agree that Dignitatis Humanae was a change in the teaching of the, of the Catholic Church, although they debate the nature and the extent of that change, uh, and they also debate how, how much of a change really took place. Uh, in your view, what were the most important factors that led uh, to a change uh, in doctrine to the extent that there was a change? Uh, and in your view, how much of a change was there really in, in church teaching on these matters? Thank you, Tim. Uh, my wife pointed out to me that this session is at the very center of the conference, equidistant from our discussion about action. And to get to this center, the church had to come through a fog of history that lasted about 1,600 years. I mean, we didn't begin in the center of religious liberty. Uh, but n nor did most other Christians, except for Anabaptists and Quakers, I suppose, we all speak of religious liberty from historical learning. We learn something about ourselves to reach this position. And so, if we go back to modern times, when it begins, Dan Philpott has written on it, the Treaties of Westphalia, 1648, which create a new kind of Christendom in the Western, in Western Europe, based on principles of sovereignty and the religion of the sovereign, territorially applied. Catholic practice of religious liberty was about the same as Protestant. Both understood both the opportunities and the constraints of living with uh, a system of sovereignty. What did you have to do to have liberty? No one could be in doubt. Find a friendly sovereign who, in exchange for protection of your religion or promotion of your religion, would demand a quasi-episcopal authority over all the temporalities of your religion. That is, buildings, cemeteries, rents on land, veto power over catechisms, the ringing of church bells, and the appointment of clergy. This was the same for Protestants as it was for Catholics. Germans, English, French, all shared the same system. Uh, freedom of religion, 1648, is basically the freedom of the sovereign to impose his own religion and the freedom of those who share his religion to have it imposed. Catholics, by the way, were even more dependent on this situation than Protestants because by 1648, Catholics are on all five continents, which meant we had a massive mission operation, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, we were doubly dependent upon the sovereigns and their ships and their treasuries. Um, under this system, there's two questions to ask. And it took another 350 years to get an answer to them. One, what are we, whose religion is privileged by the sovereign, willing to allow that sovereign to do in order to privilege our religion, to exile other religions, to deny them freedom to have church bells or churches altogether? What are we willing to put up with in order to be privileged? Question number one. Uh, I think the answer in 1648 was we're willing to put up with quite a lot in order to have a Catholic majority overseen by a Catholic sovereign. Number two, what are we willing to allow the sovereign not to do to others, but to do to us? Are we willing to allow the sovereign to govern our religion 
in exchange for favoring it. We're going to allow the sovereign veto power over our catechisms or over the matrimonial can canons of the Council of Trent, to give only a few examples. These are the two big questions, and c the Catholic Church answered them in reverse. In 1870, we finally came to clarity of what we were not going to allow the sovereign to do to us, whether that sovereign is a baptized Catholic or not. That is, we're not going to give the sovereign Episcopal powers of any kind. And at the First Vatican Council, summer 1870, the bishop solemnly declared the universal jurisdiction of the Holy See, that is, the Apostolic College does not include a 13th apostle called the sovereign. So we got fed up with the old system of restrictions on religious liberty because we got fed up with what the sovereigns did to us. Mostly Catholic ones, by the way. The Catholic sovereigns were as bad or worse than the Protestant ones. Then it would take us nearly 100 years to answer the question, what are we unwilling to have the sovereign do to other people? Now, Dignitatis Humanae has two parts. Part one is the argument for a natural right of religious liberty as against the state based upon the dignity of conscience. That's the second question. Part one of Dignitatis is, should be part two. Part two of Dignitatis is on the liberty of the church as against the state. That was settled in 1870. So to answer your question, Part two of Dignitatis is part one, historically. Everything in part two was virtually settled in 1870. We had declared our liberty from the state, corporately. We had not figured out a way to defend everyone else's liberty on the same principle. And so we needed a part one that's really a part two. And if you read the document, you can actually detect that part one is earlier in, in historic, uh, later in historical time. So we came to a two-pronged defense of religious liberty as against Westphalia. We're willing to tell the sovereign the principle on which the church cannot be invaded, and we're willing to tell the sovereign the principle upon which no human being may be invaded. Maybe a halfway change, but the main principle was laid down in 1870. Uh, George Weigel, I'd like to ask you to, to add anything you'd like uh, to sure. what uh, <clears throat> Professor Hittinger uh, discussed in terms of the, the, the way in which Dignitatis Humanae represented a change or development uh, in church teaching. Your point, Professor Hittinger, is that it was in some ways a local change. It was a, a, a reversal of Catholic policies and relationships with the sovereign that essentially revolve around Westphalia and the post-Westphalian order. A dignitatis humanae represents a rolling back of some of those arrangements and accommodations. Um, so I want to ask George Weigel to add whatever you'd like to, to that story, but also tell us, uh, uh, George Weigel, was there a sense in which the persecution of the Catholic Church, especially in communist countries, uh, helped bring about uh, dignitatis uh, humanae? How decisive were the conditions for the church in countries, uh, of course, such as Poland. But also, what about the Second World War, the experience of the Holocaust, uh, and of course, uh, also the role of Carol Wotila in the development of Dignitatis Humanae? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. I, Tim, as some of you know, has moved recently from <clears throat> the Anglican Communion to uh, that very interesting new part of the Catholic Church, which re retains Anglican forms of worship, and as a, as a sign of, of just how ecumenically broad-minded we are, we even allow him to pronounce Dignitatis Humanae in its classical form, which he learned as an Anglican. So if you're, there, there's only one document here, uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to call it Dignitatis Humanae, and Russ is going to call it Dignitatis Humanae, and Tim in evangelical freedom can continue to 
be Ciceronian in his pronunciation <laughs> there. Uh, to the first question, uh, I would say there were five uh, historical uh, pressures, if you will, that went into creating uh, the document we know as the Declaration of Religious Freedom. Uh, and let me underscore that I believe that Dignitatis Humanae is a development of the church's teaching. Uh, it's not a repudiation of what went before, and indeed the document says explicitly it's not repudiating what went before, but it is stretching the tradition. And I think there were four, uh, five historical pressures that, that led to that. The, the first is the challenge posed by the modern state, not only in its Westphalian form, but especially in the extreme forms that began to emerge with the French Revolution. Uh, from 1789 to the late 19th century, the Catholic Church was under intense pressure throughout Europe from uh, the French Revolution, the Italian Risorgimento, which was uh, largely motivated by anti-clerical sentiment, uh, the Bismarckian Kulturkampf in Germany, when Leo XIII was elected pope in 1878, half the bishops of Germany were in prison or in exile. All of this uh, compelled uh, some necessary rethinking in Catholic Church state theory. Secondly, I think there were internal theological developments uh, initiated by Pope Leo XIII between 1878 and 1903, in part in response to those pressures I just mentioned, as well as to the post-Westphalian situation. Uh, Professor Hittinger knows more about Leo XIII's church state writings than anyone on the planet, so I will let him uh, I will defer to him if he wants to lay this out, but I mean, very briefly, Leo began a slow, careful process uh, of, of re-examining church-state theory that would eventually <clears throat> uh, issue forth in the church-state theory of the Second Vatican Council. The third uh, historical factor, not a pressure, but uh, maybe a pressure in, the, in a good sense of the term, was the fact of the United States. Uh, when American independence was secured by the Treaty of Paris in 1783, uh, the Holy See uh, delicately approached Benjamin Franklin, then representing the United States uh, at the French court, and said, we think there ought to be a Catholic bishop in the United States. Who do you think it should be? And Franklin said, that's none of our business. Catholic Church hadn't heard that answer from a sovereign power for hundreds of years. <laughs> Had not heard that answer for hundreds of years. Over the next 100, 150 years, the Catholic Church had the experience of a liberal democracy in which the institutions of spiritual and political authority were separated that was actually good for the church. Churches are emptying in Europe, churches are filling in the United States. That meant we had to think again about this notion that the preferred arrangement was one in which the church enjoyed the favor of state authority. Fourth, and here we come more into the 20th century, uh, the nascent ecumenical movement within the Christian world uh, put a pressure on the Catholic Church to rethink its church-state theory, uh, because many uh, of our ecumenical dialogue partners saw this uh, Catholic friendliness to establishment uh, as an obstacle to ecumenism. And fifth, and I think most importantly to reflect upon here in Rome, the end of the papal states. Uh, when the Pope ceased to be a third-tier European sovereign and began, what Christ, began to be what Christ intended him to be, the chief shepherd of the flock, all sorts of things became possible. Uh, in church-state theory, when the Pope didn't have to think about what's that going to do in Perugia or what's that going to do in Tuscany, What's that going to do in Emilia Romana or wherever he was in charge? 
So the end of the papal states liberated the teaching authority of the papacy to think about church and state in a, liber in a freer way. Pope is no longer a temporal sovereign except over the 107 acres across the, uh, uh, the way there. Uh, that's fine, that's important. It's important to recognize that the Pope is not uh, responsible to any earthly sovereign power, uh, but that can be a symbolic, rather symbolic uh, thing like Vatican City. Getting rid of the papal states was very good for the development of Catholic Church state theory. Okay, more to the present. Um, what degree was persecution, uh, particularly under communism, uh, important in bringing about Dignitatis Humanae? I think there were four uh, groups within the Second Vatican Council, four groups of bishops for whom uh, a conciliar affirmation of religious freedom was a primary concern. The first were the bishops uh, who were deeply concerned about ecumenical affairs for the reasons I mentioned a moment ago. The second were the American bishops who almost uniformly came to the council determined uh, to see the council affirm the American uh, arrangement on church and state uh, as something the church thought was a good idea, maybe not necessarily universable and at least universalizable in all its particulars, but it shouldn't be considered a stepchild of uh, the preferred arrangement of uh, religious establishment. The third were that cluster of Northern and Western European uh, bishops usually called the Council Progressives, uh, who wanted to disentangle the church from the politics of Ancien Regime Europe. Uh, and here we can see exactly the beginnings of the Lefebvreist uh, schism in the church. Uh, and then fourth, there were the bishops from behind the Iron Curtain, who uh, did want the council to provide them a weapon with which to confront the communist slander that religion was necessarily alienating of human uh, freedom and human maturation. What about the Second World War and the experience of the Holocaust on this? I would say the ecumenical experience of resistance to the Nazis in the sec during the Second World War uh, the relationship, say, between the confessing church in Germany and Catholic anti-regime resistors was one important cluster of people that eventually led uh, by a circuitous route to Dignitatis Humanae. But uh, Tim asked as well about the experience of the Shoah, the experience of the Holocaust. Um, I'll never forget something Russ uh, said to me seven or eight years ago when we were uh, on a kind of pilgrimage to the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex. Uh, and there are those famous railroad tracks at Birkenau. And we were standing at the end of the tracks, uh, right before the memorial to the uh, martyrs of, of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And, and Russ said, uh, I think not intending to be clever, simply intending to be accurate, this is the end of the line of the modern state. What, what, that represent, what that line represents is literally the end of the line uh, of a modernity in which state power is unchecked and in which religious freedom is not robustly protected in constitutional and positive law. Uh, so I think in that sense, the Holocaust uh, experience um, was very important. Finally, on Carol Wojtyla, uh, and Dignitatis Humanae. Uh, Wojtyla made several vocal and uh, uh, four or five written interventions on Dignitatis Humanae in the third and fourth sessions of Vatican II. I would say his three major points were to make sure that the document uh, made clear that freedom is not a neutral or indifferent faculty of choice that can attach itself to anything. Rather, freedom is freedom for, not just freedom against. And what freedom is for is truth. Uh, and adherence to the truth is an augmentation of freedom. Uh, secondly, Wojtyla was very concerned, to get back to Russ's point about part one and part two, uh, 
that the council make clear that the, uh, this matter of religious freedom and the church's affirmation of it is a question of divine revelation, not simply human reason. Uh, in a very powerful uh, intervention, Wojtyla wrote that the council should not simply repeat what the world already knows by itself, or at least some parts of the world know by itself. The council should teach what the church knows and knows on the basis of its specific revelatory sources. Finally, he, would, he insisted throughout that freedom implies responsibility. Uh, this, he said, is the tradition of the martyrs. Freedom is the necessary culmination and responsibility, sorry, is the necessary culmination and fulfillment of freedom. So those are the things I think he brought uh, to the table uh, in those debates and that I think are in fact reflected, uh, Tim, in Dignitatis Humanae uh, in one way or another. Thank you, uh, uh, Russell Edinger and George Weigel. And if I may, uh, uh, George, I'd like to follow up uh, by asking you a bit uh, about the effect, the, the impact uh, and I'll keep saying dignitatis humani in the spirit of ecumenical you know, cooperation. Um, the, the effect of, of dignitatis on the Catholic Church's relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, you and I both know Samuel Huntington made a great deal of the, the impact of the change in, in church teaching on the, the political posture of the church all around the world vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian regimes. Uh, could you talk a bit about uh, what happens after dignitatis, yeah. uh, the impact it had on the relationship between the church and the, the modern state, states that were still uh, not willing to respect limits or accountability, authoritarian, totalitarian states, and, uh, and so forth, but in terms of its wider engagement with the world. Uh, John Lewis Gaddis at Yale is, I think, generally acknowledged to be America's premier historian of the Cold War. And in, in his most recent book on the history of the Cold War, uh, Professor Gaddis, who is not a Catholic, who has no special pleading uh, in this matter, uh, simply states flatly the beginning of the end of European communism, uh, and indeed the communist project throughout the world came on June 2nd, 1979, when John Paul II stepped off the plane at Warsaw's airport and kissed the ground. Uh, I think that's right. Um, uh, but I don't think that would have been possible in the terms in which it happened without Vatican II's declaration on religious freedom. Wojtyla came to his native Poland certainly as a son of Poland, a beloved son of Poland, uh, an extraordinarily charismatic figure, but he would have only been that and only been a Catholic sp figure speaking to and for Catholics, absent dignitatis humanae. Rather, this charismatic Pole suddenly became a spokesman for the world yearning for religious freedom. So the whole thing was put in a much larger context uh, beyond, uh, because of, of dignitatis humanae. And that Catholic, what I have called for 20 years now, the Catholic Human Rights Revolution that John Paul II ignited, uh, put religious freedom at the center of any meaningful scheme of human rights. The effects of that were seen first in Central and Eastern Europe in the revolution of conscience that eventually produced the revolution of 1989 and the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, but I think you also see it in Latin America, uh, where there was in the 1980s and in the early 1990s a turn away from authoritarianism and towards uh, constitutional democracies. Uh, and it, it had an effect in East Asia, uh, in South Korea, and in uh, the Philippines. Uh, I don't think that Catholic human rights revolution would have been possible let me put it this way, it was much easier for that to happen when the Catholic Church was now front and center in the quest for everyone's religious freedom, for everyone to hear the Church's call for other basic uh, 
civil uh, liberties, and political rights. Uh, Tim, let me just stretch the question a bit and say that I think Dignitatis Humanae, by taking a problem off the table, off the ecumenical table, why do you guys still like established churches? Dignitatis Humanae removed that question from the ecumenical equation and therefore enabled a more theologically focused ecumenical conversation and interreligious dialogue. We could get down to the serious matters of how do we understand uh, God's revelation, how do we understand the workings of, of God in the world, absent this um, clutter of uh, issues uh, involving established churches and how does the sovereign treat uh, the minority churches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With all that off the table, uh, people could get serious about um, theologically based ecumenical conversation and a religious dialogue. And that's perhaps a, an unexpected but nonetheless welcome um, uh, side effect, unintended consequence, if you will, of this document. Great. Thank you very much. I, I'm now eager to turn to Mustafa Akiol. Um, Mustafa, uh, you have just heard George Weigel talk about a Catholic human rights revolution. In some ways, uh, Mustafa, you have represented, embodied, you have argued for what could be called an Islamic human rights revolution. And I want to ask you, especially in the context of this conference where we've heard uh, leaders of Christian communities around the world uh, tell of their suffering, uh, sometimes at the hands of governments that are officially Islamic, sometimes at the hands of um, even democratically elected Muslim majorities. Uh, we've heard tales of their persecution, we've heard their pleas for uh, human rights, uh, recognizing that uh, uh, Muslims may be the majority in many of these societies. We've heard that their Beatitudes, uh, Patriarch Sacco and uh, Patriarch Yunnan make these kinds of pleas. Does Dignitatis Humanae help to inspire or provide a model for an Islamic human rights revolution in your view, a shift towards a greater appreciation and embrace of, of religious freedom? Do, we, do you, as a Muslim uh, liberal, learn anything uh, from uh, Dignitatis Humanae? Thank you, Tim, and thanks for having me here. Um, with regards to Dignitatis Humanae, I think spelling matters, and did I do it? Like <laughs> pronunciation. You did it his way. <laughs> the Anglican way, I'm so sorry. I'm not really Catholic in that Cicero sense. Is, Cicero rests easily. <laughs> yeah, but I'll try. And uh, first of all, I should say probably, I mean, there are not too many Muslims in this conference, and that's probably why some a friend today asked, like, do you feel a little bit alien here, like in the middle of all these Christians? And I said, well, not really. At the end of the day, we are all Abrahamic. Uh, and I, I said that as a personal feeling uh, because we all share, the Abrahamic people, we all share the belief that there is a creator to whom we owe our existence and that fundamental conviction really shapes our lives. Uh, but also I meant that in the sense that um, the Abrahamic religions had these burning questions of what to do with the heretics and the apostates and the infidels throughout the centuries. And the answers given were not necessarily very liberal for all of our traditions always. And, uh, but I see from the Muslim point of view that Christians have done a good job in the past couple of centuries to deal with some of the extreme uh, maybe oppressive attitudes among themselves, re-articulated their doctrine, as we see in the Dignitatis Humanae. No? No? Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying. Uh, doctrine, and I admire it in that sense. Uh, just to remind that these are universal questions for all of us. Now, on the issue of persecution, before I even get into that, just one observation. Today in the world, Muslims can be oppressors, persecutors. They can be oppressed and persecuted. They can be on the same side with Christians as being uh, persecuted communities. In Burma, we just heard about the Christian persecution. There's a big persecution of the Muslims, Rohingya Muslims in Burma, uh, with the leadership of a Buddhist monk who was 
uh, actually uh, featured by the Time magazine as the Buddhist Bin Laden, you know, which also reminds us that in every tradition you can have really violent uh, people, even in Buddhism, which we traditionally perceive as a tolerant faith or uh, tradition. So j just want to remind that, for example, in Turkey, uh, the authoritarian secularism that closed down the Halki seminary of the ecumenical patriarchate was also the exact same doctrine that banned the Islamic headscarf in the universities and official spaces. And in Turkey, when you look at the human rights campaign, religious freedom campaign, sometimes it defended both the freedom of both sides against a very French-style secularism, which actually didn't really respect religious freedom in the fullest sense. Uh, the headscarf freedom in Turkey is sold. Hopefully, the Halki Seminary should be opened and Halki, the ecumenical patriarchate should be fully respected as it deserves, but just one observation there. Now, when, but let's come to the issue of Muslims being the oppressors, the, the persecutors. Do we have that? Yes, we have that. From ISIS, the most extreme case, to other, uh, from these very extreme groups like Boko Haram, to milder but still very oppressive cases like Saudi Arabia itself, many Islamic countries that implement the Sharia as they understand it. They do bring oppression to the table. And, but why, what are, what are the key issues here? I think the three major issues that needs to be addressed are the issue of dhimmi, the protected status given by Islamic law to uh, Christians and Jews, and not even given to uh, the Yazidis, by the way. Uh, then, comes the category of apostasy. Uh, if a Muslim ceases to be a Muslim and becomes a Christian, that is considered as a capital crime by uh, traditional interpretations of Sharia, and that's implemented by some countries, and that's why you have cases of a Christian convert brought to court for apostasy, and if he doesn't or she doesn't re renounce uh, and revert back to Islam, uh, there will be a punishment, a death penalty. And, and the category of blasphemy as well. If you insult the religion, your punishment will be uh, death, and that can be given by a court, or that can be given by vigilantes of Al-Qaeda by their attacks on Charlie Hebdo. That's not a religious freedom issue, that's a freedom of expression issue, but it ultimately ties to blasphemy. Now, these are burning issues that we Muslims have to address. Now, we have one disadvantage. We don't have a pope who could come out and say, I thought out the process, I mean, with all the cardinals, and we thought that on these issues we need change, and here's the great, you know, new dignitatis humanae of the Islamic version. We don't have that. Uh, Islamic world is not like Catholicism. It's a bit more like Protestantism, in the sense that you have endless number of Muslim communities with imams, sheikhs, authorities, uh, sometimes under the control of states, sometimes independent, sometimes quasi-state, with different denominations. They're all saying this is Islam as we understand it. They all say this is the true Islam. And the true Islam, in one way, can be very tolerant and progressive, in mind, and it can be very, very threatening, as we see in the extremist cases. So that diversity, that this organizedness, if you will, makes the job much more different and challenging. Uh, now, there could be one institution that could have been something like the papacy, which is not exactly because it was political rather than religious, but it was at least a authority for Muslims. That was the caliphate, which is truly hijacked by the so-called ISIS today. Uh, one thing we should remember about that cal the, the original caliphate, or the last remaining legitimate caliphate before right. the so-called, was the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottomans, in all these three issues, actually brought some modest reforms. They abolished the Vimma status and brought equal citizenship to Jews and Christians with the Islahat or Reform Edict of 1856 under the caliphate. So Islamic scholars justified this. Uh, they abolished the ban on apostasy, so it became possible in late Ottoman Empire to go out and say, I'm an atheist, and there were atheist thinkers in late Ottoman Empire uh, or converts to Christianity. Blasphemy too, they got rid of most of the things because the Ottomans basically came from, they, well, they wanted to win Western consent. That was, there's a political context to it. They want to win the hearts and minds of Christians who were rebel in rebellions, that was one thing. But also they were coming from this Islamic uh, Hanafi school of jurisprudence, which thought that you can update and you know, develop the doctrine and, and jurisprudence. 
that allowed that flexibility. Today, the groups that we call the Salafis are most dangerous because they don't allow that. They would say, for example, you're speaking of a development of a doctrine, that would be a heretical term because the doctrine is already given and finished and it's frozen already way back in the eighth century, the prophet and the first generation uh, of the pious warbearers. For them, it's closed. That's why ISIS even reinstituted slavery, saying that it was there in the seventh and eighth century. So in that sense, do we have an understanding of Islam which allows the development of a doctrine? It's, it's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my argument is that we, since we don't have a papacy, we're actually living in uh, something like the 17th century Europe, uh, 17th century England. Uh, you need people like John Locke <laughs> to come and rethink the tradition, make intellectual arguments, and argue that non-coercion, which is actually grounded in the Quran in the famous words, let there be no compulsion in religion, uh, is you, the you basis. Ha you have those kinds of thinkers now? I, 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 that this is my next question. We and do. I'm glad you already began to sort of express. We, we do need. have. And could you talk about, of course, key thinkers in the Catholic tradition were thinkers like John sure. Courtney Murray, um, uh, who Actually, began to rethink sure. the Catholic tradition before there was an official sure. change. Uh, are there equivalents in the? There in the are many. Actually, since the late 19th century, a lot of Muslim intellectuals, which learned about the West and modernity and democracy and liberals, got fascinated by it and looked back to their tradition and said, let's revisit and readdress the tradition. And they offered interpretations from uh, uh, Abduh, Muhammad Abduh in Egypt to Namak Kemal in Turkey and so on and so forth. So there is a, Albert Hurani speaks of this uh, in this great book titled the, the Arab, the liberal thought, uh, the liberal age in Arabic thought, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, that tide, however, collapsed with World War I and the colonization of the Middle East which made liberal ideas the ideas of the enemy, and which led to reactionary socialism, nationalism, and Islamism, and ultimately. Yet today, in the past couple of century, uh, decades, you still have now this Islamic modernists coming up in Europe, in, in, in every Muslim country. In Iran, there's Abdul Karim Surush. In Europe, there is, I think, Tariq Ramadan is an important Muslim intellectual, and who's trying to rethink within the tradition on these thorny issues. And, bringing uh, new perspectives. In Tunisia, Rashid Ganoushi, the leader of the Nahda party, the spiritual leader, who is, who would you count as an Islamist, but the most liberalized or like uh, pragmatic form of Islamism in that sense. You have these th thinkers who offer an interpretation to these issues. And there are some people who are convinced by those. There are people who are not. One thing that makes our job difficult uh, is this. Liberal tendencies within Christianity developed in the West, and I'm using the term liberal in a very Lockean mm -hmm. sense here. Mm -hmm. uh, when the West was not challenged by a powerful foreign civilization. Now, in the Islamic world today, in the past two centuries, the dilemma is that on the one hand, there are some really good liberal freedom, democratic ideas where we hear from the West and which actually is persuasive, we can actually root it in our own tradition. But at the same time, the West is the source of anger and imperialism and all that. And there's always, the radicals have always these, a narrative that we won't change because the West wants so. Right. And my argument, and the argument of people like is, we won't change because they want us to change. We need to change precisely because we have to be loyal to our founding core principles. Mm -hmm. We have to change because of our own need for change. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that's what we're going through, all this bloody. But mm -hmm. that is one dynamic that really is in the, on the scene. And, and it is, in that sense, uh, confrontations between the West and the Muslim world makes our job difficult. We want Can yes, I yeah, ask yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I, this is this is all utterly fascinating, and probably another great argument against the Sykes Picot Treaty here. But um, I would say that this retrieval of the earlier of a of a of a deeper Catholic view drew on the Catholic medieval experience, which was one of great social pluralism. Uh, and indeed religiously warranted social pluralism. Uh, 
the notion of, of royal absolutism, for example, I think was an aberration in Catholic thought. It wasn't the main line of it. The main line of it is that rich associational pluralism of what we would call civil society today in the Middle Ages. And I guess the question is, is there an analog to that in the history of, of, of Islam? Uh, where and who were some of the key figures in that? Did they involve the great Islamic philosophers of, of the uh, late first and early second millennium? Could you speak mm -hmm. to that a bit? Great question. There was a powerful tradition of Islamic civil society. The very institution of a foundation, waqf in Arabic, was actually developed in the Islamic world because here you had a, a money protected from the government's confiscation through the sacred law, through Sharia. So the idea of charitable foundations began in medieval Islam. There was actually theories that said that it actually originated in the Islamic world and went to Europe from there, like some of the banking techniques, but that's a different discussion. That actually died out with modernity, which we think as a, generally as a blessing. The modern states in the Islamic world, from Turkey to Iraq to Syria, uh, they understood modernity as the over-empowering state. The, foundations, the private foundations in Turkey have been confiscated by the secular Turkish Republic of Christians and Muslims throughout the 1920s because that was modernity. And at the time, modernity was best exemplified by Mussolini, corporatism. So we got a bad modernity, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Coming from the interwar experience uh, in Europe, and that was what we saw as modernity. And uh, after World War II, the Europe, Europeans moved on to a more liberal synthesis. The British and the Americans were always different. But that didn't really come to the Muslim world, the liberal, limited states. So you, on the one hand, you had a tradition which was pluralistic, but was, was hierarchically pluralistic. So there was a problem of hierarchy of Muslims on the top, Christians the dimmy, and Jews, the dimmy, the dimmy. respected. But yeah. that had to change, but it changed with replacing that with the fascist Right. Uh, corporate state, which is still, still we see as Ba'ath, the republics and so on and so forth. So we never got this Anglo-Saxon, you know, liberal state and that sort of tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's something people, me, are like kind of working on it, just conceptually. I mean, I can't find a state, but 